I wanted to figure out how to unmute myself. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. Okay. <clears throat> okay, should I start now or? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Okay. So, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Arab. I'm the emergency medicine R2. Today, I'm going to talk about dental trauma and their management in the emergency room. Uh, I chose this topic only because I've been um, catching up with my friend from uh, the US. She's a dental resident. And so we had fun together. So we thought to do something together and just catch up with, uh, with each other. So I'll start. Uh, OK, yeah. So basically, dental trauma accounts for 5% of all bodily injuries, uh, but up to 17% are in, in preschool children. It has peak ages. Uh, usually, it's peak at the age of two to three years when the babies learn to, uh, learn to walk, so there's more recurrent falls. Um, it peaks as well at the age of seven to 11 years because that's the year where they start contact sports and they have more activities. And the age of 21 years is where they have more motorcycle accidents, more car accidents, become like fights and, um, and that's how they like, break uh, their teeth or like have dental injuries. It used to be that the male had more prevalence of dental injury than females, but more, more recent publication found there was equal distributions. And as I mentioned, the mechanism of injury, it includes falls, contact sports, uh, fights, assault, motor vehicle accident, and bicycle accident. And it's worth mentioning that if a child is less than two years of age and present with dental trauma, it's, it's, um, it's basically one of the red flags and we have to assess their oral mucosa to see if there is any other injuries, especially like perineum uh, bruising, which means there is like more forceful feeding. And it's, it's basically, it's worth uh, notifying uh, uh, um, child care, um, um, child protective uh, care and uh, like it's a sign of an abuse. So it's better to uh, see like social services and uh, these other uh, uh, protective mechanism for, uh, for abuse. Uh, um, and most common injured teeth are based, uh, I, I can't, I have, I don't think I have a pointer with this, but basically it's the maxillary central incisor, which is teeth eight and nine, maxillary lateral incisors, which are uh, uh, seven and 10, and then the mandible incisor, which are 24 and 25. Uh, crown fractures and luxations are the most commonly occurring of all dental injuries. And uh, from studies, it was found that uh, among the patients with maxillofacial fractures, there was 41.8% of them had con uh, concomitant dental injuries to two or more teeth. So any facial traumas, we um, fractures or traumas, we have to make sure that the, uh, the teeth are intact and there is no luxation or any fractures that involve the teeth. So basic anatomy for the, uh, the teeth structures, uh, we're gonna go from superficial to deep. We have the enamel, which is the outermost uh, layer of the teeth and it's the visible layer is one of the hardest parts of the teeth and give it the strength. Um, it, the intact enamel will appear white and shiny. The second uh, layer is the dentin, which is uh, which makes the most of the, uh, of the tooth and it slides beneath the enema animal uh, and basically it has a yellowish uh, discoloration to it. We have then the innermost uh, structure which is the bulb which has a neurovascular supply of the tooth and uh, if it's exposed then this part will become inflamed it becomes painful and this is why patients sometimes comes with like if it's if it's exposed it will be like very painful and it, they're gonna need analgesia and um, basically pain management for that. Then we have the root, uh, which is basically the, the structure that's um, embedded inside the alveolar uh, bone. Um, uh, we have the periodontal ligament, which is one of the most important structures uh, in the development and stability of the teeth uh, themselves. Uh, and this ligament, uh, if it's get damaged, if it's uh, 
if it uh, gets injured, basically the the tooth won't be stable, and also as well, it won't uh, it won't help it uh, get embedded again into the alveolar bone. And basically, the alveolar bone is the bone that holds everything together. How to classify uh, the teeth? We have either if it's permanent teeth or primary teeth. Basically, the permanent teeth are numbered from one to thirty-two. And we start the numbering is from the uh, third, uh, right upper third molar to, uh, and then we number it to the 16, which is in the left side. And then from that to the lower side, from the left, we, uh, we go down until the, the other, uh, to the right th uh, third molar uh, in the lower side. And they are numbered. We can either classify them with this number or by their names or like, a right upper quadrant or left uh, upper left quadrant, and we then we say if it's smaller or incisor or the premolar. As for the primary teeth, uh, we have 20 primary teeth in, in children, and each quadrant has five teeth, um, and they usually erupt at the age of six months, and all primary teeth are present by three years of age. And they usually are classified from A to T. And it's the same concept. It's from the right upper um, uh, uh, molar until like you go clockwise downward. Uh, uh, and it's worth no, uh, mentioning that in, in kids, that other than the primary teeth, they do have the permanent teeth uh, not visible, but they are there in their, uh, in their bone structure. So if by any uh, time the, the primary teeth is compromised, it's much better to remove it than to like keep it or like return, like re-implant it. I'll, I'll speak about that later, but it will damage the permanent teeth. So it's much uh, better to save the permanent teeth earlier on than, than to have any complication later on. So, uh, as, as like, I'll start my present, like the presentation with the case, like a patient presents to the ED with a dental trauma uh, and, the, and the injury is as, pres uh, as presented in the picture. So what to do next in this case? Like if, if we have a center with a dental uh, uh, consult or services, it's much easier to just consult them and they come and see the patient. But what if we're not working in a center with, that has uh, dental services or if the patient is in a lot of pain, like how are we gonna manage um, these fractures or, or, or injuries and uh, uh, in the, especially in the emergency department to, to save any uh, future repercussion or to just help patients with their pain and manage them in the ED. So first of all, any dental or any trauma, we have, uh, we have to do our ABCs. Um, and in and, 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 and this presentation, um, we're gonna assume that the patients are only coming with dental traumas and they're otherwise a, uh, ABC, uh, regarding the ABC, they're all stable and they don't have any other traumas except for their dental um, uh, traumas. So what we're gonna do is like for the examination of the um, of the dental, we have to inspect, palpate, and do some functional assessment. For the inspection, we have to make sure that the patient there have all their teeth are either intact or in their proper uh, place. We have to account for any missing teeth or um, or any uh, fragment of the teeth because uh, we have to make sure that the patient did not aspirate that tooth or did not uh, have um, or did, uh, the tooth is like accounted for and not being aspirated. The second thing is that we have to check for any other laceration or any other um, uh, involving injuries, like if there is any fractures, if there is any laceration to the mucosal, oral mucosa for the gingiva um, or the oropharynx. And if there is any brisk bleeding or if there's bleeding that we have to stop. As for palpation, we have to uh, look for any loose teeth. If it's if it's not already fallen out, we have to make sure that there isn't any loose teeth. Um, if the if there is any painful, um, if it's painful to touch or uh, to percussion, and we have to make sure that there is no step off, which means there is a fracture or a crepitus in the or a bony tenderness over the maxillary bone or the mandible. 
And in the, uh, for a functional assessment, we have to make sure that the patient is able to open their mouth. There is no trismus. And we have to suspect mandible fracture in people who are unable to open their mouth more than five centimeters, or if there is a positive tongue blade bite test. Uh, the tongue blade bite test is basically, as the picture shows, uh, you can uh, allow, uh, you can let the patient um, bite on a, a, a tongue blade, and if you were able to break that blade, then it's a negative test. If it's if it's if, if they if you cannot break it and the patient is unable to bite on that. Uh, uh, tongue blade, then this is a positive uh, test, which means there is a mandible fracture and the patient will need like a CT and um, uh, dental uh, or, uh, maxillofacial surgery involvement or dental, uh, invo uh, dental services involvement. So the type of, type of dental trauma that we're going to talk about today is dental fractures, avulsion, subluxation versus luxation, and intrusion traumas. Uh, for a fracture, basically, it's a discontinuation of the uh, of the uh, um, the normal to, uh, teeth. Um, we have a classification for dental fractures. It's called LSA classification. It's basically based on the anatomy of like where the fracture happened, uh, or what is, uh, anatomical structures involved in that fracture, how the patient present, and then it will guide us about the about the management. Of the uh, of that fracture, we can also describe it by anatomical uh, uh, injury, but we're gonna go with the LSA classification. So the first class is basically there is a break in the superficial animal uh, uh, layer only, which is the outer layer. Uh, patient, uh, you usually they present with no pain, but there is like. Sometimes it's just that the feeling of something has been broken or there's a sharp edges, but it's, uh, it's painless to temperature, air or percussion. Uh, it's gonna be like a chalky white fracture line. And usually there is no immediate, like the, it, sometimes it doesn't need an immediate treatment in the emergency department and they just need to follow up with their dentist for uh, cosmetic repair. However, if there is like sharp edges to the, to the, um, to the tooth and if emery board, which is the filing um, uh, tool is available in the emergency, it's worth uh, doing that. Uh, but otherwise patient can uh, safely be followed with their dentist within like two to three weeks. And we advise the patient to have soft food uh, for the uh, for the two weeks just to not disturb the, uh, the teeth. Class two is basically a break in uh, through the animal with the, the dentin will be visible. And because of the dentin, as I mentioned, it's a, they ha it has a yellowish dis uh, discoloration or the, it's colored, um, it's yellow in color. So the, it will appear as an ivory or pale yellow fracture line. It could be sensitive to heat, cold, or air, but it's usually non-tender. Uh, because of the um, uh, exposure of the dentin, uh, we have to prevent any bacterial pulp contamination. Uh, so what we do in this case is we cover the exposed dentin with a calcium hydroxide or cyan uh, cyanoacrylate tissue adhesive and then cover it with a dental cement or dental foil if it's available in our emergency. These people will need a 48-hour dental follow-up uh, and uh, analgies uh, and like pain control, uh, either NS8. Uh, NS8 can be very helpful in their case. Uh, if, it's, if the pain is very severe and the patients uh, like can't tolerate it, there is also um, a nerve block uh, that can be used depending on which side of the, of the um, of the teeth it's involved and it can help them for the 48 hours until they see their dentist. Basically, this is the, um, the calcium hydroxide applicator. There is uh, the catalyst and the base that uh, you mix them together, you form a paste and then dry, uh, make sure that the teeth is dry with, you could dry it with a gauze and then apply the pasty formulation that you, uh, that you had from the, 
that you, ha you have formed and just apply it on, uh, on the tooth and it will dry within a few minutes. This simple uh, treatment will help patients uh, with their pain and prevent any further in, like, uh, infection and bulb involvement in the future, which can help them like prevent them from having maybe a root canal in the future or uh, any complication for that uh, tooth basically. Class three is there is break through the animal dentin and the, the bulb will be visible and you can see it from the picture. It, it has this pinkish red um, uh, appearance. It sometimes can be mistaken if it's bleeding, but if you just wipe it with a, like if you dry it with a gauze and it's not, not bleeding, this is usually what the bulb is. It has a pinkish red fleshy uh, color. Uh, and it can be painful, uh, or if it's if the neurovascular, um, a neurovascular, uh, if there is a neurovascular compromise, that uh, it it wouldn't be painful. Uh, this one is a dental emergency, and the the, uh, the dental services like uh, maxillofacial or dentistry has to be involved immediately. Uh, if the like if there is no available dental services if the if they're if they can see them within the like few hours that they are in the hospital we can cover it with the calcium hydroxide and the dental cement just to help it not to get further infected to help the patient have more better pain control um and we can uh an L, uh, nsa is um uh, is good a pain control for those for those or we can do as well a nerve block which is either uh, anterior superior alveolar uh, nerve block, or we can do just uh, periosteal uh, nerve block for them. Uh, if there is a bleeding, a patient can bite on a gauze, and uh, and that gauze can be soaked with lidocaine and epinephrine. That can help um, stop the bleeding. But this one is a, a dental emergency, and a patient has to be seen uh, by uh, by then. Uh, dentistry immediately. As for alveolar fractures, this, uh, this fracture is of the alveolar uh, part of the maxilla or the mandible bone and will likely involve two or more teeth. So you can see how in the picture there is like the disturbances of the teeth continuity and there is like multiple teeth to get like together that they are like moving uh, as, as a unit. Uh, and it will be very obvious, uh, and um, it, it's usually involved in a more severe trauma. They usually have gingival laceration. There is two or more teeth uh, ha are moving together. Local anesthesia is, uh, is as needed if the patient is in severe pain as well. Uh, nerve block is very helpful in this case, either uh, periosteal or anterior or superior alveolar blocks. Um, if can't be seen like immediately with the patient uh, with the dentistry and it's easier to do a simple manipulation in those cases we can do it in the emergency uh, and add a, a longer splint to help stabilize the fracture but if if it's uh, if it's not uh, uh, if it requires more manipulation if it's if it's more severe it's usually much uh, better to uh, let the dentistry or uh, maxillofacial surgery be involved in this case and to uh, for because they need surgery so they, they need to be seen within 24 hours what we need to know is that uh, for a dental um, um, dental trauma if uh, if it's a single dental trauma it's very it has a good prognosis but a lot of time um, uh, it hap uh, dental trauma occur like two dental traumas together. It's either a fracture or luxation and concussion together, which can cause more of uh, synergetic uh, negative synergetic effect and cause more uh, injuries and more uh, uh, risk uh, for pulp necrosis and infection. Uh, so single trauma is much, it has much um, uh, uh, good prognosis, but if it's multiple uh, um, traumas to the same tooth, it has a higher chance of pulp necrosis and those teeth will need uh, a close dental follow-up. Uh, as for imaging in the emergency department, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if, we, uh, if there is any 
um, any uh, uh, extra, like uh, if we do any dental x-rays, but if we're suspecting any facial trauma, is like depending on the story, depending on the mechanism of uh, injury to the patient. So if we're suspecting any facial traumas, uh, a CT, contra uh, a CT uh, is recommended for this patient and the cervical spine CT to identify any uh, bony involvement. And if the patient is either a child or an elderly and teeth aren't accounted for, like we have missing teeth, we don't know the story, uh, it's much better, it's, it's recommended actually to do an just x-ray just to see if there is any chances of aspiration uh, and to like identify if there is any uh, uh, tooth that we basically misplaced. As for avulsions, it's another type of traumas, and it's it's a basically it's a complete separation of a tooth from its alveo uh, from the alveolar bone by a traumatic injury. Um, it it can happen at any stage of life, so it can happen at uh, in the primary teeth. It can happen in permanent teeth. For the primary teeth. We do not at all try to re-implant a primary teeth back to its socket. It's it's a it actually can cause more harm than ben benefit, and it can cause damage to the development and eruption of the permanent teeth. Because as I mentioned before, and you can you saw that um, the the image of the permanent teeth above the primary teeth. If we attempted to re-implant of um, uh, a primary teeth back, it will damage the alveolar, uh, it damage the um, periodontal ligament, it will damage the alveolar bone, it can cause actually indentation to the permanent teeth, and sometimes it can uh, prevent them to come out later in life. So never, never, never uh, uh, re-implant the primary teeth uh, to its socket. We have to determine the location of the avulsed tooth and, and uh, see the risk of uh, aspiration. And we have to check for other uh, injuries and this patient has to be seen by uh, dentist. And uh, we, we, we have, if, uh, if it's a child, we have to just assess the tetanus uh, immunization status. If, it's not, if they are not immunized, we have to give them uh, the tetanus injection. As for the permanent teeth, it's it's this is the opposite. It should be impl re-implanted as soon as possible. Like if if it's if it happens immediately, that's preferable. But it has to be re-implanted as soon as possible because the the tooth outside of its environment doesn't survive long. And if if no medium was used to save that tooth, it will last less than sixty minutes. So how to, uh, for the avulsed tooth, we have to handle it with care. We have to handle the tooth, by, like we hold it with the crown, never um, uh, handle the avulsed tooth with, uh, from the root because the root, can, uh, the root contains the periodontal ligament and any injury to the periodontal ligament will compromise the, um, the viability of that tooth so it wouldn't, uh, and if the periodontal ligament is damaged or it's, uh, it's non-viable, that even if you re-implant the tooth, it wouldn't be uh, stable um, enough to like, uh, um, to, to just re-implant. It will be like very um, it, loose and then it's gonna fall off later on. Uh, and I, as I mentioned, if re-implantation isn't possible as soon as possible, a medium has, to be used to preserve the periodontal ligament uh, viability. The best medium is basically the patient's own saliva, like uh, the saliva of the patient them themselves. If the patient is, sorry, if the patient is alert, oriented, uh, not a young kid, very reliable, they can keep the, the tooth inside their mouth until they uh, arrive to the hospital or uh, until the reimplantation can occur. If, if they can do that, then we can use the patient's own spit in a cup and keep that uh, tooth um, viable there. If, if that's not uh, available or if it's not, uh, it can't be done, then we have a Hanks balanced salt solution that can uh, uh, help the teeth uh, to survive for 12 to 24 hours. 
Um, and we have the oral rehydration solution that also it's the same uh, timing of the Hanks balance salt solution. If by any chance none of these are available, if the patient is outside the hospital, if we don't have any um, uh, like facilities or anything, then milk can actually preserve uh, the teeth for three to eight hours. So how to treat a patient with a false tooth? We have to give them some sort of uh, pain control. We consider uh, using a supraperiosteal nerve block and you can see it from the picture where they put it in the, um, in the, uh, in, in the fold of the, of the, um, uh, uh, the labial fold basically, uh, no, uh, the uh, periosteal uh, uh, side above the, above the tooth. And um, what we do is usually rinse with the saline, rinse the tooth itself with the saline, but not forcefully um, remove any debris because any forceful movement can damage the periodontal ligament cells and we don't want to do that. We have to irrigate the socket, the, the place where uh, the, the, the tooth uh, we need to re-implant. We irrigate it with, uh, to remove any debris or clots, and then we attempt to re-implant the tooth there. Uh, what's usually done is after re-implantation is we, we do a splint to, uh, to keep the tooth in place. And that splint is basically to stabilize the tooth with the other normal, um, uh, stabilize uh, normal teeth around it. We use usually a co-pack. I'm going to show you how it's done in a bit. Uh, it's basically a resin and a catalyst paste, and we mold it from the anterior and the posterior. And it doesn't matter if we re-implant the tooth in a perfect anatomical place, as, as long as it's in place and it's in, in its socket. It doesn't matter if it's like a bit... Uh, crooked or anything. It's just, it's mostly important for the periodontal ligament to be in its place. And so it can stabilize the tooth and attaches to the alveolar bone. We have to prove, uh, this, will, this will provide the 24 to 48 hour stability. And the patient will be advised to have a soft diet, but to avoid hot liquid because it can actually liquefy the pack and they need a dentist consultation within 24 hours, they will be seen. Uh, this is the different type of regional uh, dental blocks. We have the su uh, supraperiosteal nerve block uh, and the infraalveolar nerve block. This is the one I was uh, mentioning throughout my talk. It's, um, and according to my friend, I've, I've never done them before, but according to my dental uh, friend, she's like, it's very easy and there's very um, uh, uh, low complication with those and it's very easily done in the emergency. This is the COPAC applicator. Basically, it's a catalyst and the, ba and, and the base and then you, you, um, uh, you form a paste with them. And then it bec uh, and then you have to dry the the teeth uh, with the gauze and apply it from the anterior aspect and the posterior aspect just to form a a good um, uh, a good uh, uh, splint for it. So what to do if we don't have a copac? Uh, I'm not sure if there is any questions in the. I I can see it come down and. There's a few questions. So, I mean, uh, you can either save it to the end or go, go through them now, it's up to you. I, I can't see them, I can't. I can't uh... So maybe we'll just go through them at the end and I can. Okay, okay, that's, that's fine. Uh, if we don't have the co-pack in the emergency department, if, we, if we're just gonna try uh, to improvise or like if we just don't have the proper equipment, we can do a, a good splint with a skin glue and either stir strip or a foil from a suture pack. And I'm gonna go through how, like I found it very interesting and uh, that's why I put the how to do it if we don't have the pack at, um, at uh, in the emergency. So basically this is the thing that's uh, like the tools that we need. And, and this is a very like a demonstrative uh, way and they, we have the avulsed tooth and uh, and uh, and uh, the teeth mold. 
we have a syringe for flushing and cleaning. We have the foil from the, in this in this slide they they got the foil from like a surgical mask and uh, basically a, a, a tape just to uh, uh, enforce the um, the uh, the splint later on. So basically, we, as I mentioned, never, never, never touch a tooth by its root. Just handle it with, from the crown. Uh, clean the socket and remove any clot or debris from there and dry it. Uh, this is how we gently flush the tooth and with normal saline, but never force uh, the cleaning. We reinsert the tooth inside. Uh, uh, the socket, but with a good alignment, not as I mentioned, not a, like a perfect alignment, but like it, it doesn't, you don't put it like from anterior to posterior, you just like as like aligned with the other, uh, with the other, uh, with the other teeth. Put, uh, we can let the patient uh, bite on um, a tongue depressant or uh, um, uh, um, a tongue depressant or gauze just to stabilize the tooth until we like fix it with um, uh, with uh, with uh, with the splint that we're gonna apply. They use uh, the foil from the um, uh, the mask and with the with the adhesive uh, with the glue and you can add it to the teeth. We what they did is I don't know if it's seen here but they basically folded the end of the foil around the normal teeth just to keep them all in one alignment and they enforce it with the glue and then they will add more about uh, the, um, the uh, cyanoacrylic tissue adhesive just to re-emphasize the, the strength of the, of, the, of the foil itself. And basically this is how we do it if we don't have any other um, uh, fancy <laughs> dental equipment and and patients can like this is can save a, a tooth from being uh, uh, an unviable afterwards and you can see it from the inside how in the, in the last picture how the foil has been uh, turned and covered the other normal uh, stable teeth just to keep everything in alignment Okay, so after we stabilize the teeth with uh, the foil or with the copac and, and splint it in place, antibiotic is recommended in these cases. It's a doxycycline 100 milligram per oral BID for a week. If it's kids or if, uh, if, it, if in pediatrics, we use penicillin or clindamycin also for one week. The indication for the use of antibiotic is to help the periodontal ligament to heal. Uh, if there is open dental alveolar fractures, treatment of a secondary infection, or people at risk for subacute bacterial uh, endocarditis, it's not indicated for infection prophylaxis. Like we don't use antibiotic with uh, dental fractures or the, like any of the illness uh, classification because uh, it, it's it, it's not necessary unless there is multiple fractures, unless there is uh, oral mucosal injuries that uh, that's happened together. But otherwise, we don't use antibiotic in fractures. We only use it with the avulsed uh, teeth, and it's the doxycycline. Chlorhexidine rinse BID for seven days is very recommended and very beneficial for the survival of the teeth. It, it helps to decrease the bacterial load in the mouth, and that will help us. It helps uh, decrease um, any bulb necrosis in the future or it, uh, any infections that, that superimposed infections. Um, uh, and it's recommended for any dental trauma to use chlorhexidine rinse. Um, for, like my friend was like, please let uh, like everyone know that chlorhexidine is, is a must, and any dental trauma is very beneficial to give them at least for a week but not to extend it to more than two weeks because it has a discoloration uh, effect on the teeth and it's, that's a complication, but only for seven to 10 days. And we have to make sure that the patient is uh, up to date with his tetanus immunization. As for subluxation, um, it's an injury to the tooth. It's, it's a uh, supporting structure with abnormal loosening, but without displacement of the tooth. Uh, the tooth can be tender to touch or light tapping. It has, it can be um, 
uh, high, like more uh, increase in mobility, but it's it's not displaced. And sometimes there is bleeding from the gingival uh, gingival surface, but it sometimes doesn't. Usually for subluxation, there is no much treatment to do in the emergency department. Unless there is like excessive mobility, there, or if there is more tenderness when biting on the tooth, uh, then we, we can add a, a passive or a flexible splint to stabilize the tooth and they need to be followed up with their uh, dentist within two weeks. As for luxation, it's basically the tooth is partially displaced from its socket. Uh, the management for luxation is to reposition the tooth gently and apply the periodontal pack for splinting. They can be discharged, but they, these, will, these people will need a 24-hour dental follow-up and they have to be on a soft diet. The most important luxation is basically a lateral luxa luxation because it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a severe anterior transfer impact. Uh, it, sorry, it's usually happened because there is a severe anterior transfer impact, but can also occur, especially in the kids, it can occur with a forceful pull of something when the patient like holding in their mouth, biting, and they fall forward. The, the, this, this forceful movement can push the tooth in front and uh, lock uh, the root in the, in the back of the, um, of the alveol alveolar bone. Uh, so the tooth will, uh, root will be displaced with the apex lodging into the labial al uh, alveolar bone fragment and fractures. Um, and this, uh, this tooth will become abnormally angulated in their socket. So it's very obvious, you can see it. It's very, it's painful and it's usually immobile because it's, there's, it, it's, it's been locked in place. Uh, there can be bleeding and, and it's some, if it's not painful, uh, or sensitive, then there is a neurovascular uh, damage to the bulb, which is not a good sign. That means there is going to be like a complication later on. So sensitivity in, in this uh, type of luxation is a very good sign that the tooth can be saved, um, the pulp can be saved. But if the pulp neurovascular uh, structure has been compromised, then the patient will later on with their dentist will need like a um, uh, root canal or something like that. Uh, as for emergency uh, point of view is if we can dislodge uh, that tooth from its socket is basically with gentle pressure and try to dislodge it, then that will be preferable. But if we can do it, then uh, emergent, um, a dentist uh, needs to be, see it, uh, to be seen like immediately just to help it. Uh, so because they're gonna splint it and they're gonna monitoring it, monitor it for four weeks. If we can do it in the emergency basis as like dislodge it, splint it, that would be great. But if it's not, the, uh, if we couldn't, then dentistry has to be see, uh, has to see this patient. This is other types of luxations as well. As for intrusion, intrusion is basically the tooth is displaced apically, so it's much it goes basically inside um, the gingiva. Uh, it's uncommon and it needs a, a, like a very severe longitudinal impact and the tooth basically is rammed into the alveolar bone, uh, normally associated with small fractures as well. So there's going to be more um, committed uh, other fractures. Um, the management for intrusion, if it's deep, which means that it's more than three millimeter uh, intrusion, or there is underlying alveolar bone fracture, then this is a dental emergency and patients need to be seen uh, in the emergency department with the dental services and they need to reposition and stabilize the patient immediately. If it's less than a three millimeter intrusion, then it needs urgent dental repositioning and stabilization. We have to assess for other injuries as well, as I mentioned. and. In this case, do not touch uh, or try to reposition this teeth at all. It can cause more uh, harm than good. Uh, we have to clean the tooth, make sure that the other lacerations has been fixed or treated. And, we, uh, and if the patient has been seen by dental um, or if it's like less than three millimeter, patient can be discharged on soft tooth, but they need uh, 24 hour dental follow up, like the next day or like in the, in the same host, like the same uh, emergency visit. So 
in general, what's the instruction to give for patients after trauma is basically they have to avoid contact sports. They have to brush their teeth twice a day with a very soft toothbrush just to help because the tooth is sensitive, there is pain, uh, the, um, the oral mucosa will be sensitive. So a, a very soft brush is very is recommended. Um, as I mentioned, the chlorohexidine mouthwash, mouth rinse is very important, especially for the next 10 to uh, like for one week for, or uh, two weeks. And they have to maintain a soft food diet for two, for two weeks. Okay. I think I'm gonna go for the questions before I go for the... Uh, but I can't see any. Uh, are you, if you're not able to get the chat window up, I could take a look for you and read what we have. I, um... You don't see it, okay. Um, so to start off, just to say, um, Kendall pointed out that the, the dental numbering you were using is, I, I think the, the US number in most countries use a, including Canada, have like a quadrant based numbering system for the teeth. Mm -hmm. So just to be aware of that, there are different numbering systems. Okay. Um, and then we have, hold on. Um, so Audrey's asking a question about, you know, if you're in an area which you don't have an easy access to a dentist, should, should we try and splint fractures ourselves? Um, a fractures is basically you don't splint it, like you, you put the copax on them and try to cover it. Yeah, I guess if you don't have access to... It, well, um, because the one that I mentioned about the splinting is if you have the intact tooth yeah, and you can like re, re uh, implant it and then you put the, the, um, the splint on it. So but so I was talking about the, um, you had mentioned the uh, mandibular fracture, like with the actual like bony fracture. Uh, Are you trying to replace that or should we just, because you said oral maxillofacial should ideally obviously see them and then uh, potentially do something about it. But um, to my knowledge, when they just have like those type one fractures, they don't even like, I don't even think they, or maybe they do, they, they kind of reduce them. Like, should we be reducing them or should we just wait? If it's, if it's easily manipulated and you can reduce it, then it, you can reduce it with, with putting a splint on it. This is, it is similar to the one that we mentioned, but if it's, it's a very extensive, it's better for them to see it. Um, okay, we have a couple of comments from Monica about the, some of the practicalities of managing these cases uh, by the MGHC. She, she points out that the MGHC can only get the Panorex uh, upstairs um, in dentistry, so the patient would have to be able to go up there. And then points out that we don't have Hank's solution or any of the pastes available in the ED. Um, and one simple thing to do after you've reimplanted the tooth is just to have the patient gently bite, bite down on gauze to hold it in place until, uh, until dentistry sees them. Yeah. That's for the avulsed teeth? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, they can do that. Or as I, I gave the solution for like, if, if we want to do much more, then that's fine. But yeah, a goes and letting them bite on it for a while. Yeah, for until dentistry, that's very acceptable as well. Um, I think that's most of it uh, for now. So you want to... Sorry. Oh. I'm full of questions today. Hey, with regards to the, the dental, the um, anesthetic blocks, Mm -hmm. I, I often have trouble finding like a 27 gauge needle. Are 25s okay or is that too brutal? Do you have any idea? I, I don't, I, I'm not sure. I have to ask about the, like the needle gauge, but uh, according to my, my friend is as long as you, you just go like very slowly and to like, not even that deep and just inject, they will have more pain relief than, uh, than not use anything. I don't know if I answered your question because I, I, I don't know. Yeah, it's fine. I assume the smaller the needle, the better, but um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Audrey, Audrey. I just put in the comments or in the chat, use a tuberculin syringe. And we always have those. Okay. 
Okay, so take home points from the presentation is always, always perform a thorough oral exam to identify any dental emergencies, as well as account for all teeth. That's like, uh, we have to make sure that nothing is missing and to prevent any aspiration risk. Remember to always look for other injuries and suspect mandible fracture in those unable to open their mouth more than five centimeter or with a positive tongue blade bite test. We have multiple dental emergencies and dental urgency. The dental emergencies are avulsion, intrusion, more than three millimeter, and the LS class three fractures. The dental urgencies are LS one or two fractures, the luxation and the subluxation. And always ensure the patient has patent airways and can, ha and can uh, bite on a gauze or to control their bleeding. And occlusion test is the best guide to proper um, see if you align the, uh, the re-implanted uh, uh, teeth and they are in position. And always consider chlorox hexidine rinse for uh, seven days. And though we have a base, sometimes we are limited in our emergency department, but um, we can have a drastic positive implication if, if management of these traumas done correctly. Thank you. Thanks, Dana. That's, uh, that's great. I think it's a topic we don't speak about much and uh, there's, a, there's a lot of useful tips and tricks there. Um, so uh, I think, yeah, we had a, a good number of comments during the talk. Um, if anyone has any final, final comments or questions, just post them now. Um, and after that, we will be hearing from Heather Coombs, who is going to 